Hi, welcome to this presentation developed by me, Mara Briere, a Certified Family Life Educator and founder of Grow a Strong Family. A Certified Family Life Educator is a professional with expertise in education and prevention on lifespan issues. Our focus is on family systems and the changes they go through when uprooted by chronic illness, such as a mental illness. When my adult child was diagnosed with a mental illness, I sought information and resources for our family. I am a mental health professional with many years of experience in community-based programs, and I had recently worked for an agency that provided general services for the parents and friends of individuals with mental illnesses so that they could network and find support and improve their family systems. I had an idea that the model would extend to services for adults. Nay, nay. What I discovered was that once our loved ones are adults, there is little to no support or services for families. As is so often the case, the focus of treatment and solutions is on the identified client, our loved ones, with little regard to the supporters and caregivers. So I founded Grow a Strong Family to fill this void. Grow a Strong Family provides customized family life education services to families uprooted by mental illness. We help families replant themselves. And we do this by providing a comprehensive menu of family life education services. Our only service that costs money or is a FISA service option is coaching, and coaching involves customized support, skills, strategies to it, to your family, depending on whatever it is that we agree would be best to help your family figure out how to manage and cope with the individual with mental illness. And we do this in a way that provides a lot of between-session support, surround services, referrals, uh, research information, and you always have a cheerleader in your court who has the willingness and the time to provide that kind of service to you. Uh, the rest of our services are all free to you, and they include skill-based presentations like this one, a support group which is offered twice a month in the evening in Bedford and once a month in the daytime in Carlisle. We call it Replanting Lives, and it is based on a book called Replanting Lives, uh, Uprooted by Mental Illness for Caregivers and Loved Ones, and it was written by Nancy Pizzo Boucher, and this is a wonderful resource to address the real issues that we as family members need to look at, get better at, make improvements on, and most importantly, not feel so isolated and alone. It's a wonderful group. My dog and I do pet therapy. Uh, we've been doing it for six years through Dog Bone Therapy of Massachusetts. Max is a Springer Pyrenees mix, very calm, mellow dog. Loves all different kinds of people, but has a special place in his heart for very young children, the elderly, veterans, and other people in uniform. But he's pretty happy doing services for anybody. We have a social media presence on Facebook where we have a public page, which includes many resources, materials, ideas, uh, takeaways, and a private page, which is strictly for the family members who have individuals with mental illnesses, and on that page we can vent or ask for help or just connect with other people who are trying to tread water through these difficult seas. We maintain and update our webpage, which is growastrongfamily.org, and we hope you visit us often. Uh, we're constantly adding materials, resources, links, ideas, everything. Uh, we have a blog page and a resource page. Feel free to drop by and visit. We collaborate with community-based agencies, including the Edinburgh Center, the Concord, Carlisle Community Chest, the Shana 15 Leahy Mental Health uh, Medical Center, uh, Edinburgh Center, the Carlisle, and the Bedford Councils on Aging, and the list goes on. We're happy to collaborate with everybody. <laughs> Contents of this presentation were developed with support and funding from two generous community agencies. One of them is Shana 15, and the other is the Concord Carlisle Community Chess. So thank you so much for supporting us in this effort. So today's presentation is called Learning to Move Forward, and we're going to be talking about ambiguous grief and what that looks like. 
If you want to follow along and take notes, feel free to print out or at least download the link underneath this presentation called Learning to Move Forward Handout because it includes the slides and next to the slides are notes pages. So feel free to do that. In this webinar or in this presentation, we're going to be talking about grief and we're going to be talking about strategies. And you're probably familiar with the, set, with the five stages of grief, but in fact, we have found over time that there's actually probably more like seven stages of grief. And the first one is usually shock. When our loved ones get a diagnosis of serious mental illness, it could be bipolar, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder. Um, and, and it could be a neurobiological uh, illness that is, could be Alzheimer's. Whenever that we, well, there's usually a sense of shock. Even if we suspect that something is going on, to have it said out loud is very startling to us. So we may become paralyzed and fogged and a little overwhelmed just by hearing the news. Then we might go into denial where we say, ah, no, can't be, are you sure? Maybe we want to get a 15th opinion. Then we might get really angry because it's frustrating. And we've been bottling up all of our emotions over time, and so haven't they. And so we might get angry with one another. Um, we might start bargaining. Well, if, if only you can bring back the 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 son I knew or the daughter I knew or the parent I knew or the partner I had, um, I'll do this, that, or the next thing. Uh, depression, uh, which is when we focus on looking back and remembering all the things that we share together that we may never share together again, at least not in that way. We may go through a testing time where we are looking for what kind of solutions make the most sense. And this is a pretty healthy response, actually, to devastating news, is to eventually get to a place of saying, okay, this is what it is. What, what can I do? How can I manage this more effectively? And that leads us to the last stage of grieving, which is acceptance. So we're going to be talking about this and focusing on some strategies to kind of get you through these last stages. But first, let's look at what kind of grief it is that we're talking about, because our loved ones have not passed on. They are not dead. We have not had a wake or a funeral or a shiva or whatever it is. Uh, they're still alive, but they're not the same, and neither are we. And in doing the research for this, I uncovered a wonderful article, which is on the website at um, growstrongfamily.org, and it says, when a loved one is struck with a serious mental illness, family members experience the loss of the individual they once knew and are left to cope with learning how to live with a person who is physically present but psychologically and emotionally different. And this is true for them as well because to a very real extent, they're losing a piece of themselves. They're still them, but they have morphed into something else and when they're first diagnosed, the morphing is not complete. After they lived with their diagnosis for a while and they become more familiar with their symptoms, they can become more effective or not at managing them. But for us as caregivers, as supporters, as family members, for us, we're left to cope with learning how to live with a person who is physically present but psychologically and emotionally different. They could be absent from us. They could be mean to us. They can behave in ways that we don't even recognize as the person we once knew and loved. It's different. Another word for this is called disenfranchised grief. This refers to loss that is not publicly acknowledged and sanctioned. Very interestingly, I just read an article today that was published by Psychology Today and in their blogs and blurbs best of series. And one of the articles was on disenfranchised grief. And they did, still did not touch upon mental illness. They talked about substance abuse and addiction and suicide and overdose and Alzheimer's, but they left out mental illness. Well, mental illness is right in there, as we know. And we know that it occurs in situations like dementia and substance use and criminal behavior. Mental illness is topping the list because it affects so many of us, and we are still not having a public 
conversation. As, as family members say to me all the time, where is my casserole? Where is the understanding? Where is the support? When I say, oh, my son or my daughter has a serious mental illness and they're hospitalized, why isn't anybody bringing me a dinner? Why isn't anybody asking what do we need? Is it the chronic nature of the illness? Is this fear? Is it the sense that there's helplessness or powerlessness? Is it stigma? Is there still a lot of shame? Do we not know how to ask for help? This is what happens with disenfranchised grief. We feel as if our society does not condone the kind of losses that we experience when our loved ones are physically present but emotionally and psychologically absent. Another word for it is called ambiguous loss, and that was originally termed by Boss, who is a researcher in family life education and a psychologist. And uh, she, she talks a lot about, Pauline Boss talks a lot about what this is and how to cope with it and how to manage it. And it's significant loss that lacks in clarity, finality, has no sense of closure. After all, our loved ones are still walking and talking and breathing, but they're not present for us, and certainly not in the way that we had had them in our lives before their diagnosis or they became so unwell, or since, since they are learning to manage what wellness or unwellness looks like for them. Sometimes we refer to it as goodbye without leaving. When the loved ones have mental illnesses, there are times when they cannot fulfill their roles in relationships and we miss them. I often hear this from partners, that they feel very alone in their significant relationships because their partners are symptomatic, maybe hospitalized, maybe unwell and tweaking their medications, whatever it is, but they're not available to them as a peer at that time. And that's another loss that we don't really talk about but that has a huge impact on our lives and on our families. Some things in life cannot be fixed. They can only be carried. And sadly, for most of us who are caring for and loving family members with mental illnesses, this is what we do. We carry this grief with us, this sadness with us, this loss with us, with very little societal condonement and even less from our peers, our neighbors, our friends. We have to join a different kind of support group. We have to acquire a different body of knowledge. We have to learn how to handle more difficult situations and get very comfortable with it in ways that other people don't, nor do they even acknowledge that this is the road that we're journeying. We tend to feel lost. We need to mourn and focus on what has been lost so that we can welcome what still remains and what can be created. And since our losses are not acknowledged or condoned, many times we don't even tap into the feelings of loss or grief that we're experiencing. I don't know why I'm so irritable. I don't know why I'm so angry. I'm depressed. But if you put it in the context of the diagnosis, your loved one, how their behavior has changed towards you, what your new relationship is, it, you're grieving. And if you realize that you're grieving, you're able to identify the loss, you can then say, I, I can identify this loss. I can accept that times have changed and my loved ones have changed and our relationship has changed and put your energy into more productive or constructive places with regards to this new status that you have in your life. So what you want to do is you want to think about creating a conscious and thoughtful space to grieve. What does this look like? How does this feel? Is it a quiet place in your home where you, which you love? Maybe you write. Maybe you journal. Maybe you draw. Is it a place where you can connect with other people who are experiencing the same kind of heartache that you have? but they can hold your heart in their hands and they can help you. Our Replanting Lives support group is particularly effective at providing this kind of support to family members. We understand your loss. We're experiencing it too. And we too recognize that we need to find a way to become productive, efficient, and effective using a different set of tools and skills. 
and it's very painful, and we recognize that too. Maybe you draw. Maybe you turn to the arts. Many of us do. That becomes a very efficient and effective way for many of us to move forward, to, to have a ritual. Some of us will write stories. Some of us will paint. Some of us will take pictures or go through them and make a collage. Whatever it is that you do, whatever rituals that are comforting to you, whenever there has been a loss in your life, feel free to apply it to this situation. You just because it is not condoned by the greater community or our society doesn't mean that it is not a loss for you and doesn't mean that you cannot mourn it in the way that is most comfortable for you. And using the traditions of your culture and your religion, you're allowed to do that even though your loved one is still walking around and breathing and interacting. But the, the difference is so big. You're developing a relationship with a new person. And it's okay to grieve and mourn the loss of the person you once knew and the relationship you once had. So one of the strategies that we often share is we say join with others with shared experience like a support group or an online discussion group. I know that when my adult child was diagnosed with a mental illness, I did join a support group and I joined an online discussion group. Um, in fact, I joined several. Some were very good. Some were not helpful at all. But the fact is I went looking for support because I recognized early on that what I was going through was so unusual and atypical that people could not give me the kind of support and strategies that I needed to walk through this dark hallway, and I needed some light. And I did find some wonderful resources. And you can, again, visit our, our private web page, Facebook page. That's one place to start. And from there, we can redirect you to other places, and you can give them a try. It's really important to consider creating a grief ritual, whatever that looks like for you. For me, there are several, because like we know, you tend to go in waves with when it comes to grieving. You can be okay for a while, and then it's an anniversary, a birthday, a special event, um, a, a friend's daughter is getting married, a friend's son is having a child, whatever it is that you're missing out on because of your loved one's change in life circumstances. It's okay to create a grief ritual or two or five and to put them in place. One of the things I do, and it is something from my faith, where I'll take, I'll put on strips of paper all the things that make me upset and irritable about this illness, the things that has taken from me. And I will then rip it up into small pieces of paper, and then I will burn it. And then what I do further is I put bread pieces in a paper bag and go to a pond near my house and throw the bread, imagining that it is all of these little strips of paper that have burned. And that kind of helps me give it away, let it go, come up with a clean slate. And what's interesting is that over time I've eased up on that because I have entered a place of acceptance. But for years this has been something that's helpful for me. Another thing I do is take long walks on the beach by myself or go into the woods and take the longest trail I know where I won't know I won't run into anybody because these help me get back to a good place, a centered place, a place of acceptance. Other strategies include mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness helps us stay in the present. When we're looking at the past, we enter depression. When we look at the future, we enter anxiety. We can stay in the present, and we do that by practicing mindfulness. Another thing that you can do is take yoga. There's even chair yoga. So even if your body isn't up to full-fledged yoga, there are lots of ways to modify it. And it really is helpful because it, again, brings you to the here and now, to the present, and it discharges the energy that is locked in your body through this grief, through this change, through this loss. I like adult coloring, and uh, I find that it's helpful because it brings us right here and right now, and we choose the colors, and it could be very soothing for us. There are actually wonderful adult coloring books for grief, and I would, rec I would suggest that you check those out. You can go to Amazon. I like the Affirminators. 
positive affirmations, tried and true, and sometimes we're like, oh, God, I just don't want to do that positive thing. But the affirminators are, are done with humor, so you can be positive and do it with a sense of humor. And I find that that tends to be very, very helpful. Consider what do you still have? What do you retain from the relationship? What's still going right? Are they still in your life? Do they still let you make some of the decisions? Are they still open to your guidance? Uh, who do you still have? Are there times when they're stable, when they are themselves, when they can be on top of their games? Have they reached a place of remission and they're in a good place for a long time? I've known people who've been in remission for 10, 15 years, even longer. Who do you want to be? This is about you. Do you want to be the person who's bitter and hunched over because a loved one, maybe a child, isn't, isn't moving forward in life the way you want? Or do you want to be the person who says, this is just something that happens, we can and will and did get through it, and we have lots of solutions? Make a list. It helps to make a list because then it's something that's concrete. It's something that you can look at and you can say, this is real. This is concrete. This is something I can make happen. This is something that I can do. If you're lucky and you're organized, you can even prioritize your list. What can you create for yourself that enables you to become unstuck and move forward with you? What do you need to have? When you put all of your focus on your loved one who's not well, you leave you out. Remember, the oxygen mask always has to go on you first then your loved one, same is true here. It needs to go on you first. You need to create balance in your relationship. What is reasonable for you to do? What is it that they can do for themselves? What is it that you can delegate or let go of? What are you going to be satisfied with? What makes you feel better overall? What is good for the family? Any solution that only takes care of one member of the family is not a viable solution. Any solution that takes care of every member of the family is effective and viable. So what are you doing to become unstuck and move forward for you? And that's what we're here to look at. How do you move forward? We look at, first of all, who are you beyond the person who is grieving? What does your work look like if you're still working? What does your family look like? What kind of supports do you get from them? What kind of relationships do you have? How do you celebrate family rituals and holidays and celebrations? Do you? Do you want to? What kind of friends do you have? How available to you are they? How available are you to them? What kind of a friend are you to them? What kind of activities do you like? What have you given up and what would you like to have back in your life? Look at what your activity interests are, your hobbies, your talents, and your exercise. Have you neglected those? Because those are an important part of who you are. They make you you. And you need to reintegrate them into your life if you have not done so. What happens so many times to those of us who have loved ones with mental illnesses is that we become so caught up in the diagnosis and the treatment and all of the things that they need that we do neglect ourselves and to a certain extent the people around us and we become less than whole people. And in the long run, that's not helpful to our loved ones either. So we really need to reclaim ourselves so we can have a more balanced and appropriate relationship, not only with ourselves, but with them and everybody else. Guidelines for moving forward. You have the opportunity to create a different story of your life moving forward. New relationships with your loved ones. Describe in detail what this looks like for you. You can say it into a mic. You can record it. You can create a little YouTube clip. You can write it down. You can draw a picture. You want it to be very specific and very clear. Once we do something that's very specific and very clear, we are then more able to implement it because we've already seen it. And if we can see it, we can make it happen. You can do this through words, art, photography, music, dance, whatever form is meaningful to you. When you're looking at moving forward, it's really important to ask yourself, how do you feel? Who is around you? 
What does your living space look like and feel like? Is it meeting your needs? Maybe something needs to be changed. What activities are you involved in? How are special events or holidays acknowledged? Do you want to continue doing it the way you've been doing it, or do you want to do it differently? Where is your joy? Helpful self-statements include words like the following, I know I can do this. Once you have visualized it, once it is clear in your mind's eye, yes, you can. You can do this. Keep breathing in through my nose and slowly out through the mouth. One step at a time. Calm down. This is difficult. Each step I take is a step forward. Acknowledge how hard it is. Acknowledge that you're still moving forward. I love the work. It was created by Byron Katie, and it is a phenomenal tool for accepting what is and living better. It also makes us have more responsibility in our relationships with ourselves and with other people that are more stable and evenly balanced. The work challenges our thinking and allows us to break free of unproductive patterns. If you think of a person who could use your advice, typically our loved one, you fill in the, the blanks below, and then you ask yourself the questions on the following slide. My son or daughter should or shouldn't. My son should take his medication. Is it true? Yes or no? If, if yes, go to question two. If no, move to three. Let's say it's true, yes. Can you absolutely know that it's true? Most of us would say no, because we don't have an absolute certainty about somebody else's life. How do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? It gives me other ways of looking at my, my son's resistance to medication, for example. Who would you be without that thought? I might be more open-minded to exploring other options on managing his symptoms. Turn the thought around. Find specific, genuine examples for the turnaround. Can you find other turnarounds? So what we do with the turnaround is we say, is it true that he has to take medication? No, it's not true at all. So if it's not true at all that he doesn't have to take medication, then why am I pushing it? Would I want somebody pushing this on me? How would I feel if this were the reverse? For more information, go visit her site. It's called The Work. Um, and she has a book called Loving What Is, and it is the complete guide. However, her website has tons of free resources, and we have those resources as well beneath the presentation that you are listening to today on our site, growastrongfamily.org. Moving on doesn't mean you forget about things. It just means you have to accept what happened and continue living. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that you're letting go, moving past, forgetting them, ignoring the history. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that the, the past is in the past. The history is the history. We're moving forward from today onward. And we are not imagining tomorrow only because we don't have the capacity to do that based on what our new today looks like. Nor is it helpful to do that because then we're living in tomorrow and we're not living in today. We need to be as focused on today as we possibly can be. Again, in this presentation, we've talked about grief, the seven stages of grief. We've talked about ambiguous or disenfranchised grief. We've talked about a host of strategies, including the work and other, other strategies that you can employ in we are going to remind you to take good loving care of yourself. Stick to your normal routines as much as you can. Eat and drink in moderation. Plan on exercise. Build in nature time. Make sure you have backup plans and backup plans of your backup plans. <laughs> Keep music around that you love. Prioritize your time, activities, and commitments. Don't take on too much. When you are grieving, just to get through the day is enough. Accept that. Be there. Let it be. If you can do that, if you can absorb the loss, then you can put one foot in front of the other and get beyond it. There is a host of resources that are available to you, and I include these, again, on our website and in much of our written materials. 
If you want more information, please visit us at growastrongfamily.org. And as always, take what you like and leave the rest. And we thank you so much for joining us today on this presentation about grief and how to move on and how to keep on keeping on. Thank you so much.